Good morning, everyone. Welcome to, welcome to a David Prouty tradition, our distinguished alumni assembly. Before you here today are two graduates of David Prouty High School who've been chosen to be honored by a committee of alumni and people who care very deeply about David Prouty's history and its future. Here in the auditorium today, we're represented by the history of David Prouty in the form of many, many graduates, some of whom are your own teachers, some of whom are the distinguished guests we have here at the, in the front of the auditorium. David Prouty has a long history of graduates who travel very far away and have wonderful and exciting lives and graduates who stay here in the community and have wonderful and exciting lives. And we have one of each today. I am so very proud to introduce to you today our honorees, Mr. Robert Noonan from the class of 1981 and Mr. Frank Morrill from the class of 1962. You're going to hear a lot about them, but most importantly, the best part of the alumni assembly is you're going to hear from them. They're going to talk about what it's like to be a Prouty grad, go out into the world, and see the whole horizon of choices and make some of them. Mr. Noonan from the class of 1981 uh, worked in business, worked in business in the telecommunications field. He is both a businessman and an engineer. He's been a corporate officer high up in different companies and he has looked at new markets for inventions and parts of the telecommunications aid industry. He's helped to revolutionize the TV industry. But helping the community is one of his greatest passions. He has always been interested, along with his wife, in helping children who are in foster care. And he himself has two adopted children now at this time, although their biological children are grown. Bob's family includes his wife of 29 years, Wendy, and their five children, Patrick, 28, Alex, 27, Melanie, 24, and the two young boys they have adopted from foster care, Jonathan and Kevin, who are eight and seven. Mr. Morrill graduated in the class, oh, and I forgot to tell you that Mr. Noonan lives in Chicago, and he is our alumnus who has gone far. Mr. Morrill has stayed in the local area. He taught as a history teacher at Millbury High until his retirement, and he is now a local historian. He researches the local area and presents his history in the form of books and slide presentations and talks that he gives to the community. He resides in Charlton. He's been married to Lenore Morrill. They've been married for 52 years, and they have a son, a daughter, and three grandchildren. Mr. Morrill says, teaching was my life, and I could not wait to go to school each day to work with students, many of whom have become lifelong friends. His days at David Prouty High School are still vivid to him, and he has many wonderful memories of his David Prouty High School teachers. At this time, I would like to invite Dr. Hahi, our superintendent, up to the lectern to present the Distinguished Alumni Awards. Thank you, every, thank you everyone for coming today. I'd first like to recognize distinguished alumnus of David Prouty High School, Frank J. Morell, class of 1962. Congratulations. Sir.
Next on, next on behalf of all of us here at, in the Spencer East Brookfield Regional School District, uh, distinguished alumnus Robert Noonan, class of 1981. Thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the program. At this time, I'd like to invite another alumnus to the lectern. Representative Donald Berthume is our state representative and a member of the class of 1983. <laughs> You gotta know how to work a crowd. Um, so as a state representative, one of the best things I get to do is recognize people for outstanding accomplishments. Um, last year, a couple years ago, my cousin and uncle um, received this award and I, was, I couldn't be here, unfortunately. So I'm happy to be here tonight. When, and this is great. Thank you, Mrs. York, for inviting the whole student body down here. It's great to see you guys. Thank you for coming. And these two gentlemen prove to you and also, when you leave the auditorium, look at the wall outside and all the people that graduated from this great school, and Prouty is a great school, class of 84, um, that, that can give you, you know, ideas and, and motivation to succeed as you further in life. So with that, Mr. Morrill and Mr. Noonan, I have presentations from the Massachusetts House of Representatives I'd like to present to you and congratulate you on your Distinguished Alumni Award. So at this time, we can present you with the highlight of our program, the speeches given by our distinguished alumni. First, I'd like to recognize and invite Mr. Frank Morrill from the class of 1962 to the lectern. Thank you. I have to move this up just a little bit. I'd like to recognize uh, Mr. Noonan and Superintendent Hahi, uh, the Principal York, thank you to the committee, but most of all, the most important group here, the students, because I think you've got a lot in front of you, and you're gonna have a lot of opportunities. I'll speak about that in a moment. It's an honor for me to be here today. You know, and I believe as I get advancing in age, it's an honor for me to be anywhere. Uh, when I first received this, this letter of selection, I was, I was pretty flattered and a little self-conscious. Flattered because I know there's been a long history of great graduates from this school, uh, and I felt great about this honor. And self-conscious, but because if you've got that many great graduates, why me? And I, I, I hope I can tell you maybe a little bit about that. I can tell you that on March 31st, 1856, the town of Spencer decided we need a high school. 163 years ago they decided that. So you've had a lot of graduates in 163 years. What they did was, first of all, have no building for four years. They just kind of bounced around a little bit from place to place. But they had a building called Denny Hall, and that now is across from the old David Prouty and it's a daycare center right now. That was originally situated where the old David Prouty is. And then in 18, that was from 1860. 1888, Prouty decided that uh, David Prouty, the benefactor, gave money. His home was now the American Legion. That's where he lived his, his life out. He gave money, $45,000 they built the old David Prouty. Today, that will get you a few chairs and a cookie. But, <laughs> In those days, it got you an entire high school. The great thing about that is you have, in this community, three high schools. Very few communities in the state have all their high schools still standing. That's kind of nice. I, I like history, so that's a great tradition. Uh, now, I'm a retired history teacher, so therefore, that was your mini lesson for the day. Any history teachers in here 
please feel free to put that on the quiz coming up. I have wonderful memories, I really do, of David Prouty and the academic preparation. And I know it's far back. I graduated 57 years ago, so I'm happy to have those memories. And I, I think there was a lot for me to take then. In fact, there is uh, one teacher who I remember having. He was a practice teacher, Mr. Crosby, sitting right here. He's still with us. I, I, I had a lot, but I'm not sure I was aware of it at the time. But I remember being at the gym in the old David Prouty because we didn't have an auditorium like this, and listening to speakers much like you are here. So what happened? What happened that influenced my journey from there to here, standing here? I'd like to tell you all the great things. Actually, it was nothing spectacular. I just paid attention, what was around me, tried to follow what I was interested in, and continued to do things that I loved. If you can do something you love, then you know the old saying is you don't have to work a day in your life if you're doing what you really want to do. After graduation in 1962, four years in the Air Force, then on to college and marriage and a child, I began teaching career right here in this building, upstairs in 1969. I came in today for the first time walking in the hallway since then, and it does bring back some memories. I taught for 34 years in college and in high school and was gratified to go to school each day. I say go to school instead of go to work because for me, it was a great joy in my life to interact with students each day. It's a wonderful thing. I still try to keep my hand in working with people. It was a wonderful, wonderful profession. Challenging, but, but never work like that. But teaching was a path I did not choose. That's not the one I, I sought. So I'd like to share a couple stories with you that'll mean something to some of the people and others will get a different message from it. Back in 1961, I was a junior in high school and I had to take a speech class. They don't have that anymore, I don't think, but I took it with a wonderful person, a wonderful teacher, Miss Gracia Burkle. You remember her, Bill, I'm sure. And I was in class, and it was my turn to get up and give a speech, to get up in front like I am now and just talk to my classmates with my speech. And I sat there, my heart was pounding, kind of like the telltale heart that Edgar Allan Poe wrote about. It kept pounding, and I thought everybody could hear it, and it was pounding in my ears. And then finally my turn came, and I walked up to the front of the room, I looked at the teacher, and I walked down the guidance and switched out of the class because there was no way. <laughs> There was no way I was turning around and face my classmates. Well, years went by. I went through the service. I came back. I did my, my, my uh, time in college. And I got to be a senior. I was at Worcester State College. And it was a teacher's college at that time. It wasn't what it is now. So in order to fulfill my graduation requirements, I had to practice teach for eight weeks. I said, I don't want to do this. I even went to the dean. I went to the president of college. He said, well, yeah, that's too bad. You have to do your eight. So I came here. I walked in the door up there, and the first person I met going down the hallway was Miss Burkle, who looked at me and said, what are you doing here? <laughs> and, I, and I told her, and she, she just kind of chuckled and said, really? You're going to get in front of a class? Well, here I am. I stood in front of that class. I can still remember the name. I won't share it with you, but I remember the name of the first student sitting out there. And I said, I like this. I don't know what happened. But I left the door open, and it gave me the opportunity. And I'm asking you, you'll see some doors. Make sure you take a chance with them. While I was teaching, I spent decades collecting old things. And now I'm one of them. But that's OK. I collected old documents, old photographs, and negatives. I really had an interest in history. I was initially a science teacher, and then went back to school and switched over. So I, I thought when I retired, 14 years ago, I would switch over and start bringing some of this information, some of this history to the people so that it wouldn't just sit on a shelf. So I decided writing books about it would be good, and I started writing. I've got seven of them now. And I started writing books. The last one I wrote was a book called Spencer Through Time. And maybe that's what caught someone's eye and why I might be here. One of those collections that I had was a collection of 5,400 glass negatives. Uh, that's 
different sizes. They can be up to 8 by 10. It's really nothing more than a black and white negative on a piece of glass. That was early photography, uh, started in, in back Civil War time. And I, I bought these 5400 from a gentleman who, who owned the whole collection of a photographer named William Bullard, who lived right nearby in North Brookfield. And they had stayed together all those years. I began researching them. After many years of research, it opened doors that I never knew were there. All of that research, years and years. And I was writing a book on Worcester through time with my granddaughter, who is presently a sophomore at Shepherd Hill. And Hannah and I were looking through some research, looking through some negatives, and we discovered that one of the negatives had a number scratched in the back. We matched up that number with an old log book that the photographer had that I had put aside when I bought it. I didn't know what all those numbers were. And it was like the Rosetta Stone. It opened up the fact that there were African Americans and Native Americans in the Beaverbrook section of Worcester. And not only did he photograph many of them, 242, but he said who they were. That opened up all kinds of doors. So at that point, I was determined to find the descendants of these individuals from 1900, many of whom were slaves, born slaves, and then migrated to Worcester after the, after the Civil War. And I had a colleague from Clark University, Dr. Greenwood, and we spent four years researching. And we were able to find 100, over 100 descendants to meet, video, interview, and it ended up being a large four and a half month exhibit at the Worcester Art Museum in 2017, 2018. And uh, that, that brought great joy to me to see the expression on the face of individuals who didn't know they had a history, and now here it was. And here's the picture of these individuals, your relatives. It, it was, I've made a lot of friends uh, doing this. I've, I've learned a lot doing this, but it was a great joy to me. It ended up not only being at WAM, but it hit all the newspapers, the, the Globe, the London Daily Mail, it became international. And every now and then, about once a week, I would just pinch myself, is this really happening? Is this my 15 minutes? I got about 16 minutes out of it, so it was really good. But I, it was really a, a worthwhile thing. So where did it start? Right in my backyard. I didn't have to go very far, it was right in my backyard. So I would say to you, that was success to me, the success of bringing these photographs and bringing information to people, which you, I always did as a teacher. But success comes in a, a whole series of flavors, depend on your taste. Don't let someone else determine what your success will be. Never let that happen. Sometimes if you have a chance, go look closely in the mirror. What you're going to see is you. You're not going to see all the trinkets in a new car and all of that. You might see part of your new house, though, if you look close. But what you're going to see is you. So when I think of the 163 years of graduates from this school, and I know it's a regional school now, I think of everyday normal people. The people who really count. What's distinguished, I'm very pleased by this honor, but what's distinguishing about these people is they become good citizens. They become good neighbors. You're friendly to other people. You're kind to other people. That counts a lot. Remember this, all of you who are going to be getting opportunities, the younger people I'm speaking to now. A life well lived is a success. It doesn't need a lot more than that. So find a passion in life, as I did. Unless, of course, your passion is sleeping till 2 and having video games to play in your mother's cell until you're 37 years old. You may want to revisit that passion. <laughs> however, however, our opportunities are going to be in front of all of you, so many doors. Open them up. Take a chance. Don't close anything off. Imagine if I hadn't taken some of the chances I did. And I would say, leave them all. Don't close them completely when you're done. Leave them open just so you can peek in to see if maybe there's another direction you want to go in. As I looked at seniors who are here, you're about ready to go out and scatter yourself all over the countryside. You're going to get opportunities. And I'll give you this little piece of advice. You choose what you want. But whatever you choose, give it your best. I don't think you've ever heard anyone say, don't forget to give it your average. I don't think so. 
So give it your best. If you happen to receive an honor along the way, that's fantastic. And I'm very, very touched by this honor. But remember that the thing that's important is not so much the honor, but what you learned and what you did and what you achieved in order to receive that honor. That's what's most important. That feeling of honest accomplishment through diligence and determination can never be taken away from you. You'll have that the rest of your life. I look out into the audience here, I, I can see a lot of faces, and some in the back because of the lights I can't see, but I, they look to me like smiling students, and of course, that's because you're not in class, so I understand that, but uh, I used to do the same thing, so I understand that well. But remember, pretty soon those opportunities are gonna be knocking on your door. Open the door. Don't overlook the possibilities. I'm sure there were doors that I didn't open, and I, and I wonder where might they have taken me. But I don't have regrets because I opened enough doors. Open enough doors. Give yourself a chance to look. But remember, it's great to be a passenger in, in life. You know, you're going along really well. It's pretty nice to be a driver once in a while, too. So, so look to do that. And it's, it's great to get all A's. But it's possible to get all A's and flunk life. Use every aspect that you can of who you are to succeed. You can succeed at many levels. That will be your choice. And speaking of A's, that's probably not a letter I was that familiar with in high school, so it's okay. But what happens is as you get out of high school, if you're, not, if you're wanting to do better, you will learn to focus. You will find things that you can be passionate about. And I'd say this in closing. Try to be patient. And most of all, be tolerant. Because the journey to success takes many roads. And just because someone else isn't on your road doesn't invalidate their trip. Thank you very much. I told you you would enjoy that the best. The speakers are always excellent at this assembly. Thank you so much, Mr. Morrill. And now we will hear from Mr. Noonan from the class of 1981. Well, thank you. Thank you. I was going to start off with a joke, but seeing how I was never elected the class clown back in 1981. I'm going to skip that part. Well, thanks. <laughs> that went over well. <laughs> I'm humbled to be here, uh, and frankly, uh, I feel blessed to be here to accept this award. Uh, as Frank had mentioned, when I first got the letter, uh, it definitely set me back saying, why me? Uh, I'm very proud to be here. Uh, what a special honor for a David Prouty High School graduate of 1981. I want to share a story with you this morning about a simple but impactful way to view and live your life. But before I get into the story, I also wanted to share a little bit about my personal journey that began here in Spencer, Massachusetts many years ago. In 1967, when I was four years old, my family moved to Spencer. My parents, Jim and Helen Noonan, bought a big old house on Main Street, not very far from here. We had a large family, 11 kids, four girls, and seven boys. I don't think Spencer has ever recovered from the day Jim and Helen moved into town with their gang. <laughs> Boy, that house became the launch center for so many amazing things in this world. No family is perfect. We certainly had our shares of ups and downs, but I can tell you this, so much love bloomed from that home right here in Spencer. So many incredible, true, lifelong friendships with fellow Spencerites formed there, and let's not forget the many celebrations that happened there over the years, many not sanctioned by Jim and Helen. <laughs> I'd like to give a well-deserved tribute to my incredible parents, Jim and Helen Noonan. Spencer residents 
since that day they moved into town in 1967 until their deaths in their final resting place right here in Spencer, Massachusetts. God bless their souls. My, my parents never really had a lot of money. They were very hardworking people, a nurse and a chemical engineer. Their overall success is easier measured in the love and work ethic they created and instilled in others, including many friends, their children, grandchildren, and future generations as the Team Noonan they formed continues to grow. They were big supporters of education. In their view, going to college was not optional for their children. Oh, and by the way, you had to figure out how to pay for it on your own. Because they're of their focused drive and push on education, all 11 of their children went on to get at least a four-year college degree after graduating from this very school. Pretty amazing. All 11 Noonans graduated from David Prouty and have scattered. Speaking of college, after I graduated from here with honors as a Forever Panther, I, didn't, I, I did go on to U Lowell, which is now UMass Lowell, and got my engineering degree. After graduation, I took a job uh, in the emerging fiber optics field. Back in the 80s, fiber optics was a new emerging field, and looking back, it was a great choice to jump into that side of the technology revolution. My job required a lot of travel around the U.S. I was engineering and overseeing building new fiber optic systems. During my travels, I was exposed to many different things and created some amazing friendships along the way. Before too long, I had created quite a network of professional relationships that spanned the country. I stayed focused on working hard and doing what I said I would do. That's been one of the pillars of my professional life. Execute and follow up on what you say you will do. If you couple that with a positive attitude, you will be amazed at how far that can drive your career. It seems like a small, simple thing, but frankly, it has served me well over many years and many promotions. One day back in 1989, I was recruited to take a job and move out to Chicago as a senior staff engineer for one of the largest fiber optic companies in the country. I jumped at the chance. I packed up and headed out to Chicago not knowing a soul. I remember the day I left Spencer. My mom was full of tears and predicted that it was a temporary move. She expected me back home in a few years. Within weeks of arriving in Chicago, I met my now wife, Wendy. We have been married for 29 years with five kids, three biological, two adopted, and the rest is history, as they say. I never did come back. I only changed companies once after moving to Chicago, but did, did end up in many different companies through mergers and acquisitions. I also did to continue my education while out in the Midwest and received my MBA from the University of Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana. The iconic Chicago-based tech firm Motorola ended up buying the company I was working for, and I was soon promoted up to vice president level and became an executive at Motorola. When Google bought Motorola, they then sold the group I was in, in in Motorola to the company I now work for called Aris. Without spending too much time walking through my professional career, I did want to share a story that I mentioned earlier. I'll explain how this ties back into my life and how it could tie into your life after the story. The story is adopted from the Star Thrower by Lauren Elsley. Once upon a time, there was an old man who used to go to the ocean to do his writing. He had a habit of walking on the beach every morning before he began his work. Early one morning, he was walking along the shore after a big storm had passed and found the vast beach littered with starfish as far as the eye could see, stretching in both directions. Off in the distance, the old man noticed a small boy approaching. As the boy walked, he paused every so often as he grew closer. The man could see that he was occasionally bending down to pick up an object and throw it into the sea. The boy came closer still, and the man called out, Good morning. May I ask what you are doing? The young boy paused, looked up, and replied, 
throwing starfish into the ocean. The tide has washed them onto the beach and they can't return to the sea by themselves. The youth replied, when the sun gets high, they will die unless I throw them back into the water. The old man looked at him and replied, but there must be tens of thousands of starfish on this beach. I'm afraid you won't really be, mu be, be able to make much of a difference. The boy bent down, picked up yet another starfish, and threw it as far as he could into the ocean. He then turned, looked at the old man, smiled, and said, it made a difference to that one. Wow, you know, the starfish story is a good one to think about a minute. I heard the story back in graduate school at Notre Dame, and it had a profound impact on me personally. It's easy to get overwhelmed by looking at a seamlessly impossible and challenging task and to question, what's the use? What difference can I make? Well, it depends on how you look at it. Everyone can make a difference in one person's life. That's not, that's not that hard, and frankly, it's well worth the effort. It's easy to get overwhelmed and give up on doing anything. Like the old man was saying, you can't really make a difference, but you can. Focus on small steps and understand it's worth the investment. Remember, helping one person means the world to them. My wife Wendy and I have been driving change in the foster care system out in Illinois for several years now. It began after we were exposed to the system as foster parents. In fact, we, were, we both are founders in, a, in starting a nonprofit called Let It Be Us which is focused on helping thousands of kids in foster care. I am currently the chairman of the board of Let It Be Us. I have been on WGN radio and the local Chicago ABC TV station talking about what we're doing with Let It Be Us. Giving a child a chance has become our passion and mission. What we are doing is making a difference in the children's lives one at a time, like the boy in the starfish story. One at a time, it's worth it to that kid. Let me share some sad facts with you about foster care. In Illinois, my home state, there are 18,000 kids in foster care. They're the innocent victims that have done nothing wrong to end up there. In the U.S., there's well over 400,000 kids in foster care. From my view, these are the abandoned children of our society. Sadly, over 50% of the kids that are taken into care never return home to their biological parents. They need a loving home to grow up in, and many never get that chance. On average, a, a foster child moves into more than 20 different homes by the time they age out of the system. Sadly, when the kids age out of the system, the funding stops, they have no assets, no family, no unconditional love, and many end up on the streets, in a shelter, or in jail. We're driving change in the system by driving a host of programs, from mentoring the kids to getting kids adopted, to recruiting and finding better foster families that will keep kids through the tough time. We're also aiding with dignity bags, life essentials, along with educational tutoring. Making an impact on the world can come in many ways. You can do it both in your career and by giving back to your community. I believe it all starts with driving yourself to become a better person than you were the day before. Continue to do that, and you'll be amazed at how many great things will come across your path. I'd like to leave you with two things today. One, find what makes you passionate and drive it with a great positive attitude, both in your career path as well as your community work. And two, make a difference in someone's life. Start with small gestures. Make, it, make them daily. It can be to a stranger, a friend, a family member. Do something positive. Show love. You can mentor a younger child. Smile at a stranger. Call out a bully. Visit a lonely family member. You'll be surprised at how many great doors will open to you by taking the small step in time to notice and help somebody. Remember, you're truly, you, you truly do receive more back than you give. And lastly, be proud you are from Spencer and use this community as a springboard to go out and make a difference in this world. Thank you for your time.